morning and welcome to Not So Stable Coin and the Future of Crypto, a virtual event presented by the Frank Hawkins Keenan Institute of Private Enterprise at UNC Keenan Flagler Business School. I'm Gerald Cohen, Chief Economist at the Institute. The goal of the Keenan Institute is to develop and promote innovative market-based solutions to vital economic issues through research-driven efforts like our grand challenge this year, exploring the opportunities and potential challenges of stakeholder capitalism. In addition, we strive to bring to bear rigorous data-driven approaches to the economic and financial challenges of the day. So we're always eager to jump in and discuss a hot topic as my three guests and I will do this morning. We'll examine the implications of recent events in the cryptocurrency market and particularly in Terra USD, an algorithmic stablecoin that proved less than stable after it broke its peg to the US dollar last week and crashed along with sister currency Luna. The episode raises familiar questions about the risks associated with crypto. More specifically, many people are asking what Terra USD slide mean for other stable coins and whether it will increase the push for cryptocurrency regulation. Three experts join me to, to invest their, their valuable time in crypto conversation today. I'm pleased to introduce Christine Parler, professor at the Haas School of Business at the University of California, Berkeley. Christine's area of research focus include crypto and fintech. She spoke in March at our, cent at our conference on decentralized finance hosted by the Institute Rethink Labs. My colleague, Eric Geisels, who's a professor at UNC Keenan Flagler Business School. Eric is the faculty director of Rethink Labs and his area of expertise include machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data, fintech, and quantum computing applications and finance. I'll also say that when I have coffee with Eric, I come away with my head thinking like I need to read 15 books on, on what we've discussed. And Michael Cassetta, who's Chief Revenue Officer of Paxos, which issues USDP, a regulated and fiat-backed stablecoin. Michael is also a venture, venture partner at HL, h &L Ventures and advisor to Magic Cube, and was previously Chief Commercial and Strategy Officer at Compass and Global Head of Sales at Square. Our plan is to spend the next 40 or so minutes in discussion before moving on to external Q&A. So please feel free to submit your questions at any point during today's program using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll answer as many as we can. So let's just get started by getting everybody on the same page. What happened to Terra USD? Mike, I mean, yeah, I don't know what happened. I Happy As to jump who's in. in the market, you want to start us off? Yeah, I mean, listen, it, it was a crazy week, and it actually, the majority of it happened in, in an extremely short time. Um, I think what you saw from a very high level uh, is a stablecoin that was based on an algorithm. It was pegged to a basket uh, of underlying investments and, and, you know, we'll say assets that, um, you know, were not stable. And you know, our CEO was was quoted in in the Wall Street Journal two weeks ago, calling out saying that that does not look like a stable coin. That looks like an unstable coin, and it's a, a clear example here that there are two worlds of stable coins, uh, maybe even three or four, depending on how you draw the line. Some that are backed by true cash, uh, some that are backed by collateral that could include crypto or other variable value assets. Uh, some that are you know little bit of alchemy, um, which to me is what the algorithmic stable coin. Uh, world looks like. And, you know, being, these coins work really well um, when things are going well and when the algorithm is based on a set of underlying assumptions that hold. Uh, but when those assumptions start to shift, um, very few algorithms are, are able to keep pace. So um, you have some other experts here to talk about the details behind the chain and behind the, um, you know, the economics and the financial movement to these. But uh, needless to say, it was just, it was a pure example of a stable coin not actually being a stable coin. So, Mike, I just want to follow up one question. So you said there are three types, the algo, the kind of common, you know, cash backed and 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 then some combination. So can you just it, like um, Paxos, when you say you're ca you say you're cash backed, does that mean what does that mean exactly? So just so yep. we can. Yeah. So USDP, which is our stable coin, is backed 100 percent. 
uh, by cash and cash equivalents, which we just determine as short-term U.S. treasuries, uh, which the U.S. government calls cash equivalent as well. Uh, there's no underlying investment-grade securities, and there's no commercial paper. There's no crypto uh, backing those reserves. A again, it is cash. So when people put a dollar in, they get a dollar USDP. And if they want a dollar out, they can get that instantly as well. Um, and this is regulated by the New York Department of Financial Services. Our reports are audited uh, and published. Um, and I think you'll see there's a big difference in the world between being a regulated stablecoin and a registered stablecoin. Um, and having true cash reserves that are audited versus attestations that are signed by just the CEO um, of that company. Um, that, that to us is the way a stable coin should be. You know, a dollar should be a dollar. Um, and when people want to use the dollar, it should act in the same way that a US dollar today should act. Mm -hmm. um, the second category of stable coin is, is what you can call an over collateralized or a crypto backed stable coin, you know, where the reserves are, are built in, on this basket of different cryptocurrencies. Typically, these are over collateralized to allow for some deviation in value. Um, you know, it's typical to what you would do a margin account. Um, but you know, in this case, you know, that doesn't mean they're infallible, and it doesn't mean the collateral can't at some point be insufficient, depending on how wide the swings are in the market. Crypto markets swing a lot; they're high beta. We know that. Although I think if you look at the Nasdaq, you would say the Nasdaq is pretty damn high beta uh, these days as well. And who knew Bitcoin would be a better investment, for example, than I don't know, pick a, a tech stock uh, in the last six months. Um, the third category are, are, are the algorithmic coins where the basket is really pegged to, well, the, the value is pegged to a basket of, of you know, variable quantities, variable ratios of different underlying assets. And when the value of something goes down, generally the quantity of something else comes in to replace it. And that's where you saw this massive, um, you know, real devaluation of, of Luna. Um, because you saw that that basket flooded uh, with additional coins to, to kind of balance out the drop in the underlying asset price. But, you know, Christine, I think, has a lot more of the real detail in there. But those are, that's how I would just break apart the three categories at a high level uh, right now. To call an algorithmic stablecoin a stablecoin is just a complete farce uh, in my mind. It's an investment. It could be a casino. It could be a blackjack table. Uh, they may be the same thing there. Um, but it, it's certainly not a stable coin. And to call it that, I think, just draws really negative um, you know, vision to the industry. Um, and, and it starts to lump things together that just really very, very different things. And just so the ones that are backed by commercial paper, so you, you, so, so USDP, and I want to be careful, be, be yep. very careful that I say P, the P, the P. Um, because there, there are <laughs> other ones that are, that have USD. So USDP is backed solely by treasuries or cash equipment. Cash, yeah. And, but, but there are ones that are backed by commercial paper. And where would you, would you consider that a fiat backed as well? Or would you say that that's some, that's beyond, that's something that's not, um, that that's that's going into more of the yeah it, it's not fiat backed it can't be fiat backed it's backed by commercial paper you know it's commercial can paper maybe, backed yeah maybe maybe I can uh, pick up on that conversation um, I'd, I'd like to remind perhaps the audience that the day after Lehman went bankrupt uh, there was a run on money markets um, because they were holding commercial paper issued by uh, Lehman Brothers, and it was anybody's guess uh, what the value of that was, of that underlying. And so, I mean, the mechanics are different, the technology is different, um, but we're basically talking about bank runs. Um, and we've seen bank runs um, in all sorts uh, of variations throughout history. So I just gave the example of the day after Lehman as de facto a bank run on money market uh, funds. Uh, if you kind of look at uh, the US monetary history, I mean, there's this fabulous book by Friedman and Schwartz, The Monetary History of the United States, that's kind of goes through in detail uh, to everything that happened. Uh, particularly interesting is the period after the, I mean, after the end of the Civil War and before the creation of the of the Fed, which is uh, roughly between 18, 1863 when the OCC was created, the Office uh, of the Controller of the Currency, which was sort of a light touch regulation. Um, and then in 1913, the Fed was created. Um, and then in the FDIC later in 1933. So we had to sort of, 
in the decades uh, between the end of the Civil War and, and the creation of the Fed, we had pretty much every decade a major financial crisis with physically people running to the bank. We were on the gold standard. Um, banks were supposed to hold gold. That was sort of what they were supposed to have in, in, in their vaults and they could print dollars. Um, and you would have a bank in Ohio with a dollar, with the Bank of Ohio, and with a bank in Maryland or whatever. But of course, what was the underlying uh, uh, assets were in some cases um, dubious. And so you have the, the physical bankrupts and we have the same phenomenon. So the economics is the same. And, and we know we've seen that in, throughout history. We've seen it many times. It's just under a new technological, uh, technological form. Um, but I mean, there's, there have been also runs against central banks. So, and, and I think Christine will, will probably talk to that. So it's not just uh, uh, private banking, the fragmented private banking se sector that we had uh, in the history of the United States. I'd like to just, um, if I could just interject. So I, it, I think it's sort of useful when we're talking about something like the, what happened with uh, UST, is just to think a little bit about why we have stable coins. We have stable coins because we want to pay for stuff and we want to pay for stuff online or basically in the digital universe. And you know, why do people ex ac accept means of payment? People accept means of payment because they think that they can turn around and then use that means of payment to get other stuff that they want. So basically the ability to use something as a means of payment is really, really important for its uh, long-term value. And if people's beliefs about whether or not the thing that you're using to pay ever gets shifted, then essentially nobody will accept that thing and they won't accept it in like a two second interval where their beliefs shift and suddenly it's worth nothing. That's why the ability to redeem for something else that we accept like US dollars is just so important. And I think um, what the UST situation sort of told us was that you can have a very large and for up to, that, up to the point of failure, successful looking payment rail, but uh, you know, the market is bigger than any particular company and any particular enterprise. And so unless there's a redemption that stops people's doubts um, you're going to have problem with any kind of payment rail that isn't, uh, you know, robust to changes in beliefs. So just somebody put in a question in the chat, and I just want to make sure, because they said it would be instructive to define stable from the outset. So I think if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we all think that what we define as stable as it tracks one-to-one -one the peg that we're that, that the coin has chosen. And in general, those have been the dollar. Uh, and so that means that, that as you said, Christine, any, if, you, if you wanna convert from your coin to a dollar, you can do that. And I think that's what Mike is saying that, that USDP does because of their, their underlying asset the, that they're holding effectively cash and cash equivalents. So, is that, I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page in terms of that, that's what we mean by a stable coin. I know US, I know Paxos has a gold one. I, my impression is there aren't Euro based, but that's because of the economics behind holding Euros and the negative interest rates. Um, but I just, I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of how, how we define stable or what we mean by stable. Is that everybody? Uh, um, so, Christine, you had talked a little bit about, or we, you had mentioned this discussion about the algo and what it, and the runs on algo and kind of a similar and similarities to other and Eric kind of started in that direction. Other bank runs, so perhaps you can you can go go the, go a little further in that direction. Sure. I mean, I th I think the the first thing that I thought about when I uh, when the news started to come. Um, about UST was what happened to the Bank of England in the 1990s. So this is a large central bank with a huge amount of reserves. Basically, it's, it's got the, the whole of the UK economy behind it. 
And at that time, the Bank of England was trying to peg to the US, uh, to the Deutschmark. Uh, this was before the Eurozone, so peg to the Deutschmark. And um, a series of uh, basically currency, quote unquote, speculators decided that that peg was not going to be viable. And so they started dumping uh, pounds. And at some point, the Bank of England gave up and the, the UK pound became free floating. And so um, this is just an example of trying to maintain a peg when the market thinks that the peg is not exactly where it should be. And I think this is very much what happened with uh, these, this, this, very, this particular algorithmic stablecoin. So given that we've, we've set, set it up, we, we, I think we, we've differentiated between the algo, the crypto backed and the fiat backed. Um, and, and as Eric kind of described, we've had, we've had these situations in the past where we, we individual states had their own currencies. Um, so what does this mean for stable coins? What, it, what does this episode tell us? Where do we think we're, we're gonna be in five years or even worse, five months uh, in terms of the whether, whether there's gonna continue to be algo, crypto backed or fiat backed, if we're just gonna move in the direction of a, of a fiat backed as, um, as Mike and his company are, are, are promoting. Um, so where do we think we're going? So I think stable coins exist because we wanna have a currency that lives on a blockchain in order to uh, basically trade with other uh, um, assets in, in this sphere. So that's why they exist. Um, I think transparency is the big issue. It has been the big issue for any of the bank runs, uh, really figuring out what's the underlying. And I think that is sort of where we have to think about what are the most uh, solid foundations for stable coins. Stable coins will have to be uh, in existence. And I'm not, uh, I don't think necessarily central banks should be the providers of stable coins. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about that in terms of central bank digital currencies. Uh, I don't necessarily want to go into that direction. Uh, I think the, where I would like to see things is, yes, we do need uh, a blockchain based uh, money, basically. Uh, that uh, keeps its value. Um, you know, if you sort of define what money is, it should, it's a store of value, it's a unit of account, and it's a medium of exchange. Those are the three features that we have for money, essentially. And so um, I, I see the, the need for transparency, and that is uh, something that perhaps regulators have to think about, or the industry. I, the industry. I, I agree with Eric. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I, I fully agree. I think that transparency is, is really one of the first steps forward to getting mainstream adoption and then also some stability um, into the crypto world broadly. You know, I, I think you nailed it about what, what is money supposed to be. Um, you know, the definitions have been clear for a long time. Uh, and I think stable coins are trying to be that, but to be it in a more efficient, faster, uh, cheaper way, because the, the current banking system, the current monetary rails are atrociously old. They're archaic, they're slow, they're, they're ripe for error, for failure. You know, you've got banking systems running on batch processes on code that was written, you know, closer to the bicentennial than it, than it was, you know, the millennium. I mean, it's a crazy thing. And blockchain is an attempt to, to kind of replatform the movement of money globally to do, you know, what global economies are meant to be, which is to, to transact instantly, securely, for free. But to do that, a stable coin has to then act like a stable asset and a stable store of value and a stable means of um, transfer. Um, and you know what you're seeing now is there's a proliferation of a lot of different assets that are clearly not stable coins. There are also cryptocurrencies that are not stable, right? They, so you could call them whatever you want, right? And there's a question in the chat about this. Um, you know, and then there are speculative assets, which there's a word, there's a place in the world. You know, for speculative assets. But again, I think to lump all crypto together is really dangerous, just like to lump all stable coins together is dangerous until someone draws a very clean line. And I'm hoping the regulators do that. 
I'm hoping the regulators come in with very clean set of circumstances and rules and guidelines. It's very hard to play a game when you don't know the boundaries and you don't know the rules of the game. Uh, when you do, it's, it's a much easier place to play and it's a much cleaner place to build a strategy and to bring more participants in. Um, again, I think yields both that transparency and the stability that the industry is craving right now. And I don't see it coming fast. Um, I mean, Congress can't agree what day it is, let alone write clean legislation that that becomes enacted and signed. Um, I don't think the central banks are ready uh, to issue a, a digital currency, although I think they should have visibility into the ones that are out there and have access to see the reserves that are out there, whether those reserves need to be held in a place that they have direct visibility and clarity, or if those reports need to be audited and managed on a constant level through the federal government or a state government, whatever the case may be, I think there's a lot of room for that. Um, and I think the right companies are the ones on the right side of that. And I think there are a lot of companies that still see this as a casino and a way of making a ton of money fast. And I'm hoping those companies start to go away and that this is one of the first breaking points to push some of those players out of the industry, which I don't think give it the right color. Can I perhaps, um, I mean, this is a bit of advertising. <laughs> um, I wrote a paper um, uh, that was published two years ago uh, with the title Back to the Future. Uh, it's inspired by the, um, by the movies. Um, uh, and the exercise, uh, it was backtesting uh, systemic risk measures. Uh, so after the financial crisis, after the Great Recession, we had all these conversations about systemic risk. And a, lo a lot of measures were proposed and they're being used by central banks to actually monitor the banking system. Uh, not, not all these measures can be computed based on historical data because we don't really have that rich historical data. But what we did in this paper, and this is with uh, historians, uh, Ben Chabot from the Chicago Fed and uh, Chris Kurtz from uh, the Federal Reserve, we went back in time and we had historical data collected and we, we kind of did the exercise, what if a central bank had access to systemic risk measures? Would they have been able to flag uh, the kind of bank runs that we saw at the time, the, you know, the, the collapse of the railroads in 1873 and all the, the financial consequences of that, uh, the bearings crisis, the JP Morgan bailing out the US economy, et cetera. And so the answer to that was yes. So uh, I think the, the fact here is that there are tools to basically uh, keep, a, keep a, a diligent eye on, on these um, stable coins if we want to and look at what the underlying assets are, um, very much like we do in, in other parts of the financial system. Sorry for the advertising. <laughs> no, no, Eric, that's that's helpful. And one of the reasons why we we add value is because we can kind of take the academic approach and 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 say, based on the academic research, rigorous data-driven research, we can then say what's the appropriate policy response. So can you just explore you or Mike expand exactly like what if you were to say this is what we what we need? We need transparency in terms of we, the the central bank or or regulator has to see the under all the underlying assets. Like, what exactly would you, if you could wave your wand or yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't want to talk too much, and I'll just. Uh, but right now, actually, the exchanges are kind of the gatekeepers, sort of. I mean, they are the ones who list the stable coins, and listing a stable coin, you know, creates its attra its traction. Uh, so currently, in some sense, the, the, the you know the, the Binance, the Coinbase, etc., kind of decide uh, on which are the credible "quote unquote" uh, stable coins and which are not, and they do a, a due diligence process. I'm not trying to argue that they are not uh, doing that, but it has failed. Um, I think in the case of Terra is a good example of that. Uh, so I, I think it's it requires um, what we would call you know, you know, tier one assets and tier two. I mean, we, we, we have these concepts of what, what are safe assets. They, they're well-defined in, in the financial sector. Something along those lines has to be done in terms of the backing of stable coins. But anyway, I'll, that's, my, that's my thinking about it. I, I agree with, with, with Eric. I, I think, you know, I, I don't want to speak for our legal team and our compliance team, but, I, but you, you, you generally want a few specific things. 
Number one is you need to have a definition, a set of clean definitions that everyone agrees on. I, I agree with Eric that you have to, you have similar const- concepts in the, the, the liquid money supply today. There should be similar concepts applied to the digital money supply because um, eventually you'll have two money, two different money supplies if you're not careful. Um, the second is a means of reserve, a means of auditing those reserves and a means of understanding and having transparent uh, access to those reserves 24 um, seven. Although that's even better today than what the Fed has, right? So uh, there's a technology improvement that also needs to happen here for the federal government. The third is it would be great if there weren't three, four or five different federal agencies all fighting to be the one that regulates stable coins. Um, because I, I don't think that's going to give us any any you know movement anytime soon. It's just going to be a really strong tug of war with zero displacement uh, and progress made. Um, the fourth is um, if a company wants to operate a coin that's not stable, that's okay. It just can't be called a stable coin. So even just defining what a stable coin really is, and someone even mentioned at the beginning in the chat, you know, how do you define stable? And even a peg is not necessarily stable. It's stable according to one dimension and one one you know aspect, but it might not be stable to others. So uh, I would say a U.S. dollar, you know, token should operate at worst the same as a dollar. (laughs) Uh, And I say at worst because, again, dollars aren't the most efficient means of transmission either sometimes, right? And they lose value sometimes. Um, But at best, you can use some of the improvements of a blockchain and ensure there's security uh, and stability in it so that you don't have a run that's caused by a different problem you know, that's not monetary related, it could be technology related. Uh, and that's a whole other dimension here, that this is another reason why I don't think the central banks necessarily should be um, in the game of issuing these, at least today, um, until they can get the technology stack in order to be able to do this. You know, I don't know what decade the Fed's tech stack was built, but it's probably not 2022. Uh, and that would worry me a lot. Having been there during a set of upgrades, they they are they they're working on it, but they they are definitely not there. Um, I know that they were also working on trying to get twenty four hour Fed wire, which you know moves in the direction of of you know ultimate. Yeah, um, and I heard that was ready twenty twenty. We're a couple of years late. Now yeah, we're in twenty four twenty five. You know, Europe figured that out. I don't know how, uh, but they figured it out. Despite all the different banking systems, I'm sure Christine and Eric have much better understanding how they pulled that off. Uh, than I do. But uh, yeah, the world needs to move 24 seven, the internet moves 24 seven, you know, and and if you look at the generation of people growing up today, they don't understand the concept of banking hours, right? They don't understand the concept of things even closing, right? They order something on Amazon, it shows up before they eat lunch, you know, that and I I think the world has to evolve. Otherwise, again, a lot of these companies are going to be left behind. And a stable coin is a means of doing that globally, uh, at that speed. So uh, I'll get off my promotional horse of, 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 you know, technology, but I, I think it's where we are. And I think the, the economy is in an amazing shape to take this leap, um, you know, but through technology. So, so I want to, oh, Eric, you mentioned money market mutual funds and the, and the run um, post Lehman. And I, and I, I want to explore that a little bit from a systemic risk question. So, and, and even in the case of, of Paxos, where you hold treasuries, you know, if there is a, and, and it, during, and during Lehman, there were aspects where off the run treasuries were, were treasuries that were not the most recently issued, just to explain to the audience, were not, um, uh, were undervalued relative to the treasuries that were just issued because people wanted the most liquid assets. So what, what are the systemic risks, even from having just owning treasuries or moving to the money market mutual fund uh, model where you own, you may own commercial paper, depending on the fund. Again, so there are some treasury funds, but there are some, there are some broader funds. If there is a run on a stable coin that has just treasuries or has a, a commercial paper as a money market mutual fund does, does that does that could that create systemic risk in terms of the general financial system and 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 businesses being able to fund themselves because they rely on short term funding from commercial the commercial paper market and is that something that regulators need to be aware of or think of be thinking about I think it's just useful to remember that uh, prices going up and down don't necessarily imply that something is systemically risky. 
The problem happens when markets shut down and people can't actually trade. At that point, you have essentially an externality or markets are not behaving uh, the way they should. So um, that said, it's extremely important, and this goes back to the idea of having reserves. Um, it's extremely important that people feel that they don't actually have to cash in a particular instrument, that they don't actually have to uh, rely on the collateral that is behind something. So the system works best when people don't actually try to access those pools of collateral. If they do access those pools of collateral, then yes, you can have very, very large price impacts, which will lead to volatility, which could have all sorts of horrible effects. But the system works best when people think that they don't actually have to do this. And so this is why we have regulation. This is why we have the backstop of the FDIC for banks. This is why we have, you know, breaking, not being able to break the buck, I guess, for money market funds. We don't actually want people to freak out and sell collateral because that's going to have temporary price impacts. That's going to have ripple effects through the markets. So, Christine, are you saying we should have an FDIC-backed stablecoin? Which is that you know that's a guarantee not to have a run, assuming you you trust your your uh, your 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 backstop. Well, this goes back to the discussion of transparency and what kind of assets you actually observe a stablecoin holding. If everyone thinks that there is, uh, with probability one, they can redeem a stablecoin one for one at any point in time um, in the regulated sector, they're never going to redeem it. And so ideally, you really don't care what the collateral is. You don't really care about anything. You just need everyone to believe that basically they can always redeem it one for one. And at that point, you're okay, you're golden. Briefly about systemic risk, um, you know, the untold story about uh, the uh, financial crisis of 2008 was that besides the headlines about Wachovia uh, turning insolvent and Washington Mutual, etc., there were also a number of smaller banks that actually got into financial trouble. But the FDIC basically uh, built, not built him out, but basically helped uh, to create uh, a transition period where deposits were insured and the local bank that was in difficulty was basically merged with another bank. There was a smooth transition process that happened in sort of the shadows of the discussions about systemic risk uh, during the Great uh, Recession. And so uh, that's the type of regulation that you really want to want to have. Uh, in this case, it was for local banks, for smaller banks, but that, that solved the problem that didn't exist, for instance, during that era that I alluded to earlier before World War I. Um, and so we need to sort of have uh, something, a backstop uh, for uh, the stable coins that is akin to what the FDIC does. Um, uh, something that looks like that. So there's a question in the chat, and and I'm taking it early because I think it's it's exact. It's a follow on 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 the discussion that we just had, which is that we're talking about regulation, we're talking about transparency. This is effect effectively an antithesis of what the original kind of goal of crypto was, right? Or maybe. Uh, maybe it wasn't the goal, but at least the, that a number of people have moved to the, you know, we don't need to be regulated. We don't need a central bank. We are just crypto. So it, are we effectively saying if you want stable coin, then you sh a true stable coin, you want to regulate it. And if you want and, and it, it's crypto or isn't it crypto? I guess I'm trying to say, like, what what is stablecoin? Is it crypto or not? Is it or I'm happy happy to jump in on on this constant uh, kind of paradox of the world that we're in. But there's a difference between blockchain assets, blockchain based currencies, and cryptocurrencies. The way I think we we've, we've kind of built the connotation. There's a difference between Bitcoin. Right, which could be which is highly decent, fully decentralized, right, with no governing structure, 
right? And but it doesn't have the 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 ease of means to transfer value to buy goods and services, and and today it's not stable, right? So that's a very different thing from a stable coin, which is meant to look and act like a dollar. If you want, to Christine's point, people to trust that something should be accepted, then they also have to trust how it was made, right? And they have to trust to know what's behind it. And, and these are all very different things. If you want a regulated business to be in the world of crypto, well, they're not going to be able to play the game of an unregulated product. They're only going to be able to work with regulated partners. So there is a paradox here of the existing world we're in, right? And playing in the existing world while simultaneously building technology and building something that, that scales into the future for what could be a very, very different world. Um, so is it antithetical? I don't necessarily think so. Uh, but again, I think a stable coin is meant to look and act like a dollar today, not to look like Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is meant to not look and act like a dollar today, right? Because of the decentralization and, and the potential growth or store of value aspect of it. Uh, but again, I think these are two very different worlds and they get lumped together because they're both based on blockchain. But if the financial system crashes, right, due to nothing related to money, but because of technology or government intervention or corruption or something, people are going to want to be able to get their dollars out and they might not be able to go to a bank to get it, but maybe they could pull it off of an ass of a, of a, a blockchain wallet, a crypto wallet and move their dollars somewhere else, which poses other problems as well and other opportunities. Right. But I, I think that's, that's where I would at least start to draw the differentiation. I think it's also useful just to uh, think about how the, the digital asset space has grown. If it's uh, sort of true believers who understand the technology and are willing to play in this space, that's one thing. Uh, but if it is a, a large swath of retail investors for whom these assets represent a significant portion of their income, let's just say, the, the government basically, you know, its mandate is to sort of look after these people along some dimension. And so immediately you get regulation or calls for regulation. Um, and I think um, if the crypto world wants to grow, it wants to get those retail investors in. Uh, but at that point, basically the door is open for regulation. I think so it's, I completely agree with Christine, uh, but it actually goes beyond that. I think a lot of the traditional actors in the financial sector are sort of staying on the sidelines because uh, they are sort of nervous about the fact that there is no clear, there's no clarity about the regulatory environment for uh, this uh, digital crypto uh, blockchain based uh, financial sector, part, part of the financial sector. Um, so that that it's not only the retail investors that's important, and I agree completely with Christine. But it's also a little bit broader that there is a there is a large swath of financial institutions that are just staying out of it um, for the moment. And the, the industry, the crypto industry, would benefit greatly from uh, having a, a more uh, solid uh, regulatory environment that would uh, create a more st stable. Uh, universe, not only stable coins, but a stable universe. <clears throat> I, I can just say, based on what I see in our own pipelines, um, and you know, PAX is a little different. You know, we we again operate at the highest standard of, of regulation, federally, state level, you name it, uh, even internationally. So um, we we have many of those very large financial institutions actively involved in scoping out what they are going to do. Um, and they come in all different shapes and sizes. You know, you look at the likes of an interactive brokers, which is a FINRA regulated broker dealer that's allowing all of its retail and institutional customers to trade crypto. PayPal, you know, in the US, you know, obviously one of the largest global fintech companies. Um, but it's really exciting to actually start to see the really traditional banks, uh, the very large traditional banks start to enter the space in their own way. And they kind of dip their toe at the beginning. You know, JPM Coin, for example, which is just an intra bank settlement mechanism, We're looking at some of the private blockchains they're building to understand blockchain technology across Goldman, across others. And that's cool to see, but I think the real opportunity will now come once they do see the mainstream a bit, once they see the ability to, to move into the mainstream and that crypto is becoming transparent enough that they can participate fully, 
it opens up a whole other world of product development for them and services they can provide and their markets can grow globally uh, in a way they couldn't otherwise. And, and I, I think Eric is dead on is that up until very recently, it was all gray. And anyone who spent any time in a bank knows, you know, if it's gray, stay away. Um, because that's a great way to put yourself on the wrong side, you know, of the rules and the law when they get written. Um, so it's it's good to see. I don't think that the regulators are moving fast enough um, on this. No surprise. Um, but I'm also glad to see that the regulators have been highly engaged. Uh, almost every audience I've spoken to recently in person, every conference, there are regulators in that room, listening, learning, asking questions, and I think it's a great thing to see. And I think the big banks have now started to see that level of engagement versus looking at it like a you know, it's either alchemy or, or some, you know, curse. Um, and I think it's just part of the evolution of, of the innovation curve that we'll start, to, that we'll continue to see for a while. If I could just touch on this, this idea of innovation, this is going to sound a little bit kind of weird, but here we go. Um, the idea behind uh, the Terra blockchain was absolutely great. It was a low cost payment rail that could be widely adopted that would basically allow people to get around the sort of inefficiencies in the correspondent banking system. It was just such a good idea. Um, obviously, there, there were implementation issues, uh, but I think uh, that as a society, this is something that we need and something that we've got to go, go to. Where exactly, uh, how we're gonna get there, I don't know, uh, but definitely the, the movement is towards innovation in this area and it's time. So, Christine, I was going to ask that question that you started to answer, and I'm going to push it a little bit to you and our our and our and, and our other panelists, I mean, Eric and Mike. The one of the goals of or one of the of crypto or is or DeFi in general is financial inclusion. So, you kind of said Terra was was working in that direction, but then they ended up at cross purposes because the system blew up. So. If we want to encourage financial inclusion, what what do we need to do to get there via blockchain? So one of the biggest promises of some of these uh, blockchain systems is just reducing the costs. At the moment, the you know the correspondent banking system basically acts as neutral collateralization. So you have these large pools of capital that are just sitting there and being used extremely inefficiently. And every time you kind of do a transfer, it hops through multiple banks, each of whom takes a slice. The implication of that is for very, very small retail investors who are transferring $200 from where they work to back home, they're paying absolutely massive fees. Um, so, uh, one of the promises of um, these sort of innovations is to dramatically reduce the costs, allow people to enter this market, have a way in which some of these chains are interoperable, so we don't get people who are building off massive network effects to extract rents, and reduce costs. Um, and once that happens, it becomes, you know, you can transfer money without there being a massive tax on people who are transferring small amounts. And that we think is going to help, uh, hopefully will help with financial inclusion. Yeah, uh, if I can add to that, that's a little bit the business model of, for instance, Ripple, which um, has sort of suggested as using the blockchain for interbank operations, um, um, which are very costly through alternatives such as SWIFT, for, for example. Um, I completely agree on the financial uh, inclusion potential, but it's always useful to remind ourselves of what happened in El Salvador, uh, where Bitcoin became a legal tender and supposedly was gonna be a solution for inclusion of a lot of people using uh, blockchain-based uh, currencies. Uh, but then we're going back to the discussion about uh, the decentralization of blockchain uh, as opposed to some central authority, uh, like a central bank and a regulator. So, so uh, I, I think that the financial inclusion debate uh, is, is right on. It has enormous potential. 
but it can only uh, be realized um, if we are sort of uh, uh, think seriously through uh, the sort of steps that we went through with the with the traditional banking system over the last century and a half. <laughs> Namely, you know, we need to create uh, not a fragmented banking system, but one that has common uh, rules and 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 creates transparency and trust. You know, we, that's exactly what it is. Money is based on trust. So, Mike, I, I, can I? Yeah. So, if I, you, you are based on your your business model is effectively trust. So, if I were to do a transaction in USDP and then I want to convert it in dollars or, or I want to get off the rails, my impression is the that that's a fairly expensive. And I don't know in your rails, but an expensive business model. So, is that is is are your rails cheaper? Is that cost coming down? Is is pressure from different marketplaces forcing that? I mean, what's the what? I mean, that seems to be a big issue in terms of what happened in El Salvador, where yeah, it's great you can do all these things if you stay on the chain, but once you try to move off the chain, it's just it's super costly. So th there's a lot in that very sh short question, um, Sorry. and you know it, it's a great problem. It's a great problem to expose because it's part of the evolution, I think, of blockchain, which is you're moving from slow, high value blockchains like like a Bitcoin, right, to a slow and expensive and sometimes low value blockchain like Ethereum, um, where it's meant to move smaller amounts more frequently, but still not at the speed that, for example, you would see Solana, right, move at, which is a much higher throughput blockchain, but has scale challenges and technology challenges that you know are probably more solvable uh, than not. Um, then you have the part of the problem that that even Christine referred to, which was you know the part the, the layers and the intermediaries required to move money around the world. There's still that at the last mile. You know, if I want to keep dollars USD, you know USDP inside the system and move it digitally from one player to the next, that's easy. That's free. That that's simple. It's fast. It's instant. Uh, and it's secure. There's no deterioration along the way. But if I want to send money to someone in, I don't know, Bangladesh, and then they want to convert the USDP into local currency, there's there's going to be a friction point there that someone's going to have to do, and, and that generally costs money. Okay. One of the beauties we've seen, though, um, is that we now have remittance corridors set up through our platform for hundreds of millions of users across the world where they can send money to one another for free, you know, all around the world. And if they keep it in USDP, right? Yes, again, they can move it and they could spend it, you know, online almost any place you could find, you know, whether it's through PayPal or one of our other partners, they could spend that naturally. What we're seeing in a more exciting way is now all the kind of traditional payments providers and acquirers now getting into the space of, okay, how do we accept USDP, right, on these rails so that someone can interoperably move their money and my merchant, who's my customer at XYZ Payment Company, can now accept this, whereas previously they could not. So this is an evolving space. Um, it's one that I think the friction is starting to go down. Um, and to, you know, to the points made by both Eric and Christine, you're seeing many new entrants in this market as a result of the low friction to get in it. You know, in Brazil, you look at Nubank, what an amazing story, 53 million users with not a single physical location you know, in there. Um, on our platform, we've had more customers trade crypto through Mercado Libre than who have ever traded securities in the entire country of Brazil, right? Which is, is really amazing to see just how different this is. And it's bringing in a whole different type of, of participant, you know, into the banking universe because the banking universe just looks very, very different than it did in the past. And just how are you handling the know your customer issue? So one of the challenges is that you know crypto there's no regulation in that but once you're saying we need a regulated market at least in this space that also comes with knowing your customers which is a which creates a friction so how is that that's non-negotiable right if we're going to be part of the US financial system in any way uh, KYC KYT KYB know your business right know the institution sanction screening uh, anti money laundering protocols like you know, I hate to break it to the oligarchs, but they're not going to use Paxos anytime soon uh, if they're trying to move money, you know, in and out of Russia. 
Um, you know, but we, we don't want to be on that side of this game. We want to be on the side of the game where the U.S. government and the Fed and the, the EU look at us and say, that's a partner we can trust so that we can do all the things that Eric and Christine said are necessary to be able to participate globally sustainably you know, in this space. So, yeah, sorry, we, we, we have to know who's on that side. And if you're going to transfer money, right, there's a new rule called the, the, the travel rule, right, which requires both sides to be named and known by both parties for value to transfer even just digitally through crypto. Otherwise, it just does not work. Is that a, uh, I mean, I mean, I, I'm very much in favor of this. I'm just trying to say in terms of creating a friction. So, you know, you want to send money to somebody in Bangladesh, you have to, you, somebody, these people have to have some level of verification. And I guess this is maybe the internationalization of the financial system. Is that right? Yeah, they, they may have a wallet on the Bangladesh side that's already been, you know, opened or known or, or somehow sanctioned locally. This is the interoperability Christine talked about, about knowing and being able to trust through the blockchain without having to go through manual effort to verify that this is a, either a, a sanctioned or somehow um, trusted or accepted or verified account to be able to send assets into. I think this brings up... Uh also the, the sort of international dimension of uh, the regulatory environment. Um, and it's, it's kind of worth reminding ourselves that we have something like the BIS in, in Basel uh, with, with international agreements on, you know, what is value at risk? How should it be computed? Uh, how should banks, man, uh, you know, deal with uh, risky assets? Uh, so there is that component because we're not really talking necessarily about just one country here. I mean, yes, we're talking about the stable coin for the U.S. dollar, but uh, I mean, we have to um, bear in mind that this has a huge international dimension, and and uh, there there exists coordination coordination uh, uh, in the traditional banking sector. And I think it's also worth noting that we should think about that in that direction too for the crypto world. So I, I, I think we've covered a decent amount of the questions from the audience, but I do want to, there is one question about higher interest rates and the impact on the crypto market. Perhaps it's just as a macroeconomist, I relate everything to macro issues, um, but it to me, it, it's maybe the, the fact that Terra blew up in an environment in which the Fed is raising interest rates in which inflation is rising, well, maybe inflation issue I'll put aside, but does that macro affect crypto or how does the macro affect crypto? One of the things that we're seeing in a lot of the crypto protocols are just absolutely silly returns on investment. And the reason why they're so silly is because these uh, protocols are trying to grow and they're trying to basically attract people. And so essentially they're burning money trying to do that. So at the moment, if you're talking about yields in the crypto space of just absolute, I don't want to even mention the numbers, they're just so silly. Um, local interest rates in terms of real interest rates or even nominal interest rates in the real world or off chain don't, aren't really going to have an effect, um, I would say. Interesting. I got a, an advertisement in the mail, and who, who gets mail, for a, a crypto that was offering 38% interest. And I was curious, how, how can they do that? Um, and, and Christine, I think you're saying, and I've, in my research on this, it's that they're effectively subsidizing people joining the, their, their chain or joining their, I mean, exactly. joining they're, their chain, they're providing, joining their currency. Yeah, they're providing governance tokens or sweetener tokens. Um, and the anticipation is that those will have value in the future. Um, yeah. yeah the, the other thing you're seeing is them lending, right? You're seeing a lot of lending-based returns then being redistributed as yield to existing holders of, of some of these currencies and protocols. And um, you know that, that terrifies me on, on many levels. I have an economics degree, but I cannot be called doctor. Uh, like the rest of this panel. So I, I defer to the experts of, of what the true macro effects are. The one thing that we have seen, though, despite the inflation in the US, uh, is that there's inflation in other countries that's magnitudes worse. Um, and, you know, in Argentina, in Turkey, in, in parts of Brazil, um, sorry, parts of South America, 
um, that the demand for U.S. dollars is so high. In some cases, the only way they can get dollars is digitally. Um, you know, Argentina being a prime example of that. Um, and in other cases where people do actually see Bitcoin specifically uh, as a much more stable store of value than their own currency. So higher interest rates obviously comes on, on both sides you know, of, of the economic coin. Um, but I, I am just a little worried that you know, until inflation truly stabilizes, um, that actually soaks up a lot of it. It, it kind of sucks away the demand um, for crypto. Uh, because instability generally leads to lack of, of confidence, you know, and that lack of confidence, I think, causes people to pull back on any risk asset. And I think the majority of the crypto world we're seeing today is operating like a risk asset. It's not yet operating as stable. You know, that'll take, I think, a lot more time. So so that there's a question from the audience and I was going to ask, again, that's a great a final question. So we have a set of assets that are truly trying to be stable. And those are money, mediums of exchange, stores of value. And then there are assets such as Bitcoin, which have volatility, which are known to be an, which are an asset class. So are we, are we going to end up in a world in which we kind of have two different, I mean, and maybe this is where we are, crypto is, there's crypto that's a medium of exchange and there's crypto as an asset class. Not that they're, not that it, it, is that where we're headed or is that where we are? I think without getting to the true definitions of these things, because there are legal implications to those definitions, I, I think you're ge generally going to see a spectrum of asset types from the pure stable, right, to the ultra high beta, high risk, potential highly volatile, right, type asset, which could yield returns or it might not. You know, someone told me once that collectible cars are the best asset class that you could have invested in between 2000 and 2010, right? Who the hell would have known, right? But that's true. Now, is that liquid? Is there a real mark for that? I don't know, right? But you're generally going to see some spectrum here. And I think that's actually a very healthy thing. But the cleaner and clearer we can get the definitions to be so people know what they're getting into and they know what they're participating in. And they, there's a different level of sophistication across that spectrum. I, I think it puts us in a much healthier more sustainable place. Perhaps I can draw an analogy with the corporate bond market. I mean, we have credit ratings for bonds. We have junk bonds and we have investment grade bonds, high yield bonds. I mean, that's not unusual. And so I don't really see why the crypto world would be any different from that. I mean, we just have uh, different fundamentals and different things going on. And so riskiness will be a whole spectrum as, as uh, Mike says. And I guess the different assets will have different yields. So the stable coins will end up equ equilibrating to close to treasury yields or whatever bank yields, and uh, and and riskier assets will will have 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 the have uh, much higher yields. But given that they're seen as as risky, and maybe that's do you, do you think market participants understand the risk involved in it? Well, if you go by the history of the. Uh, more, subprime mortgage crisis, I'm not sure, <laughs> uh, because uh, there was not a full understanding of um, a lot of the financial products that were being brought to market. So um, that's a, I think that's a conversation for, for another panel. And, and well, risk ratings that might not have been 100% accurate. <laughs> abs absolutely. <laughs> And Christine, I'm guessing that this is, and, and Eric, that this is going to be an area that has ripe for a lot of research to figure out exactly how we're going to, what the equilibrium we're going to end up in. Oh, absolutely. Well, best, I, I, if I can make one comparison, Ben Bernanke, who ultimately became the chairman of the Fed, he did, devoted his entire career on writing about the Great Depression. And he did that in 1990s, et cetera, which is 60 years after the events. <laughs> I, unfortunately, as Christine was saying earlier, uh, because it takes time to go through the blockchain, it's it, we're only we only know part of we only know the early version or the news version of the of what happened to Terra, right? And 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 so um, we put Eric, we put your paper in the chat, Christine. We look forward, and I know it's going to take some time to your papers on on Terra and what's going on. Um, and I really want to thank our panelists, um, Mike. That your insights in terms of what's going on in the marketplace have been and and have been extremely helpful. 
um, and Eric and Christine from a, a the academic and kind of long-term perspective. I, I, it's been a great discussion and I wish we did have more time. Maybe, maybe we'll have a panel on how people are perceiving risk in, uh, in the crypto market. And if you have any questions or follow-up, please contact me at Gerald underscore Cohen at Keenan Flagler, Keenan hyphen Flagler dot UNC dot edu. And if you want more information in terms of Institute events, please go to our website, keenaninstitute.unc.edu. And we look forward to seeing you in future panels. And again, thank you so much, Christine, Eric, and Mike. It's been a, a great pleasure.